My future guest today for Rook the Experts is a well-known Iranian-Canadian physician in the area of medical aesthetics. Dr. Amir Ruzati is the founder and director of Skin Beauty MD, one of the first and best-known medical practices in Toronto, focusing on cosmetic, injectable, and non-surgical medical aesthetics. Dr. Ruzati was born in Esfahan. He moved to the West with his family in 1985 at the age of 10. At the time, he was in a wheelchair with a severe inflammatory condition. That experience as a patient and his full recovery was a turning point, he says, that led him to a lifelong passion for working in the medical field. He overcame his illness, attended the University of Toronto with an honors degree in immunology, went to the University of Manitoba Medical School and completed family practice residency at the University of British Columbia. Dr. Ruzati is now a recognized physician with over 15 years of experience in the medical aesthetics field and family medicine. He's a well-known name in education in the cosmetic field where many medical professionals in North America have taken his Botox and fillers training courses. He has been featured in various media interviews as an expert in aesthetic injectables and Botox and fillers. And right now, Dr. Amir Ruzati joins me in the Rook studio today. Hello, sir. Hi, Gian. Pleasure to be here. Nice to have you here. Thank you. Uh, you know, in chatting with you and seeing you in and around Toronto over mm -hmm. the years, uh, it's clear that you really have a passion for what you do, for the medical profession, for the kind of work you do. It, I mean, is, is that performative or do you actually, are you actually this enthusiastic about your work? Yeah, absolutely. I remember when I first started, it might have been my like third patient in cosmetic treatment. She didn't know she was the third patient, but she said she knew I was starting. She said, Dr. Rosati, I think you're going to be very successful at this. And I said, why do you say that? And she said, because I can really tell that you have a deep passion for this. Um, and yeah, you know, I think when you've been in the field for as long as I have and through some of the dark times and the challenges as well, when you're trying to start um, an enterprise and be innovative, passion goes a long way to get you over the challenges. How far does that go? Are you excited to get to work every day or would that be saying, would that be too much? I can tell you that I was thinking about the fact that having done this for about 15 years, I'm still not bored of it. Mm. Um, and so, yes, to a large extent, uh, I don't, you know, the Monday morning blues where, you know, people don't want to show up at work. Uh, I don't really experience that. Why uh, are you not bored of it? I think it's still so impactful you know sometimes we talk about botox dermal fillers as if they're um, minor treatments but really we forget the fact that some of the results are nearly the type of results that you would accomplish with surgery and in fact mm. you know 20 years ago if you wanted to lift your eyebrows a little bit or if you wanted to tighten your skin a little bit the only solution would have been surgery and so here we are with this wonderful advance where in the right hands, you can get very impactful uh, results. Your yours was, by the way, I'm very self conscious during this interview that <laughs> my eyebrows should be lifted. My side, I keep thinking of things that I'm going to need to change. Your, yours, uh, yours was one of the first medical aesthetics clinics in mm -hmm. Toronto. You started in 2006, uh, mainly with the Botox procedure. Mm -hmm. You, I mean just as we start this off, let's call it, you, you, you've become very successful. Did you, did you have any inkling that your business would grow this way? I had a vision uh, about it for sure. But, um, you know, again, you know, I was in the first wave of physicians that crossed over from primary care practice to non-surgical mm -hmm. injections. Prior to that, this was more in the domain of plastic surgeons or maybe dermatologists. Wow. Um, you know, it took a lot of energy when I look back. It just took an immense amount of energy for the practice to be where it is today. And we've had, you know, lasting power and we continue to innovate and improve and increase uh, what we're doing. And I still feel those uh, those excitement juices, you know, I'm still... Uh, if you talk to my wife, she'll say on the weekends, I'm still thinking of ways to improve and increase the impact that we can deliver. All right. So I, I want to get into a discussion around changing perceptions of medical aesthetics. Uh, we'll do that in a little bit. But ju just to dip our toes into the waters around Botox, mm -hmm. uh, it really feels like Botox was something people were 
much more closeted about just just a few years ago and and that that's really not the case anymore would that be true in your experience yeah absolutely i can tell you from personal experience a few years ago if i showed up at a iranian function in toronto uh, a lot of people would try to avoid me because they would be worried that if they say hi to me you know their secret is out <laughs> whereas now it's the exact opposite i was just at a function over the weekend and at the table uh one of the uh Wow. One of the individuals at the table was a patient of mine, and she was proudly telling her friend, this is where I go for my treatment. So that really... And that wouldn't have happened a decade ago. No, no, no. Things are different now, you know? Yeah, I mean, not only are things different now, people who do what you do have become celebrities. I mean, there's Netflix shows, there's whole there's a whole industry around celebrating the, the surgeons who do this kind of work, right? Yeah, you're right. And I, and I still remember, you know, a few years ago, the first time that, you know, somebody just approached me in the mall and said, you know, I follow your Instagram. And, and, and I think that's the power of like, you know, social media, YouTube. And yes, there's definitely a celebrity culture around it. It's also maybe one of the more challenging aspects of running this type of practice is you not only have to be a great uh, physician, a great technician, be able to clinically deliver the results, but you have to be very comfortable, you know, marketing yourself uh, in that domain. And that's increasingly challenging to do. Just anecdotally, it, 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 is there ever a situation where you've done something where it doesn't work out? <laughs> It doesn't work out so well, and then you see them at the gala, and you go, oh, man, I could have well, done a better job, or I hope they don't say anything. Or. <laughs> you know, um, when I first started in this field, uh, a mentor of mine said, um, the mark of a good physician in aesthetics is how many procedures they decline to do, meaning how many no's mm. you say. And so we're very careful in the consultation to make sure that we're on the same page, you know, with the patient. And, and I always keep that in the back of my mind. It's easy in a busy practice to get revved up and want to mm -hmm. convert every consultation to a treatment. But I always remember it's the patient selection. It's how many no's you say at the end mm -hmm. of the day. Let me, let me, I'll, I, I want to pick up on that a mm -hmm. little later as well. But, mm -hmm. but just around this changing perceptions and, and, uh, the closeted mm -hmm. nature of, as I called it, of, of how people dealt with uh, Botox, doing Botox uh, uh, in the past. You've pointed out something interesting as an Iranian, which is that we have these constructions or stereotypes about the West being ahead of the curve and you know the East or somewhere like Iran playing catch up the whole time. But in this space, uh, in Iran, um, two decades ago or 15 years ago, it was much more commonplace to be open about doing this kind of work and not have any shame and, and to discuss it and, and uh, to want to find a good surgeon, et cetera, than it has been here, right? Absolutely. You know, you've heard that in Iran, it's almost like a status symbol to wear, to show that you're just post-rhinoplasty yes, and, and yes. wear the bandage. Um, same thing with injections. In fact, one of the ways I got my start was on my travels to Iran you know, back in 2004, 2005, and I started to see, you know, how much people are starting to get into these types of procedures. And at that time, I would say, you know, from a general uh, community level, um, there was much more excitement uh, in Iran for doing these procedures than here. Uh, so I learned that on my trips there, mm. that this is a up and coming thing. Um, and so I came back to Canada, you know, with that mindset. So always nice to visit different cultures, nice to visit uh, the home country as well. And you can always, you know, pick up certain trends earlier there. You know, I'm still amazed in Iran, like the whole Instagram culture in many ways is much more um, forward than ahead here. Ahead of the curve. Ahead of the curve. Like my grandmother is, you know, in her 80s and she'll be on Instagram all day. Whereas here, you know, that may not necessarily be the case in that age category. I actually, I'd forgotten this, but I actually know someone, young, a young person, I mean, she's in mm -hmm. her 30s, who, uh, in order to get any medical aesthetic stuff done, <clears throat> always goes to Iran for it. And 
it reminds me that uh, um, people who do like hair replacement stuff go to mm-hmm. Turkey sometimes. Mm-hmm. Like, is that is that true that 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 people would go from Toronto to Iran to get Botox yeah, done? Or? Not not so much for injectables because the the one issue is uh, well sometimes you know for surgical procedures there's obviously a cost advantage to going overseas oh, Turkey right. or Iran and in injectables it won't quite uh, you know be the same cost advantage. But the other thing is, you know, Iran can also have a culture of being a little bit extremists with certain things and so uh, that can apply to cosmetic injections as well so you know my experience or observation going on those travels to Iran back in 2004 2005 different from the last time I was in Iran which is about five years ago where I frankly felt that some you mean somebody who could something that people couldn't get done here because nobody would do it for them they'll do it in, in Iran is that what you mean at that time no now now yeah, I mean, I, I would say that, yes, you know, in Iran, as far as medical aesthetics goes, um, you can pretty much get any service that you request. Whereas here, some of the, uh, you know, a lot more physicians would be comfortable mm-hmm. saying no to a specific request or specific procedure. Um, so Iran, you know, my observation last time I was there, I haven't been there for a few years, but there was a tendency uh, to look overdone and and that goes against my philosophy as far as medical studies speaking of this philosophy which you've already referenced Mm -hmm. a couple of times you you've said you take pride in your clinic maintaining a reputation of excellence in medical cosmetic injections but also being known for integrity in what you do so uh what does that mean what does integrity mean in in this space that you work in yeah, you know, it's a fine balance. Our space, I like to say, we're not in the medical aesthetic specialty. We're in the confidence specialty because when um, when people feel good, they feel confident. Now, integrity is to not use that as a tactic to oversell a procedure mm. or sell a procedure where the patient is not gonna get the result that they envision. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. I had a patient come to me. She must have weighed close to 300 pounds, but she had done this very expensive, you know, laser sculpting procedure Mm -hmm. at like a corporate medical spa franchise. And, you know, she spent about $5,000 doing this. Meanwhile, that procedure is for somebody that is very close to their ideal Mm -hmm. body weight. It's not for somebody that, Um, is obese and so integrity for me in our scope is patient expectation being honest with what they can uh, experience and also um, also advising you know saying the no's that I referenced earlier where if you think that somebody's you know crossing a specific line where they're asking for a treatment that you don't think is in their best interest to be able to say no and to turn that but how do I know I mean I was at a a place, uh, and and uh, actually somebody had bought me a facial mm-hmm. treatment, so I went, and then the woman doing it, who also, get, I guess, does medical yes. aesthetics, had said to me, uh, uh, you know, I can make you look 10 years young, younger, you know, and, um, <laughs> and I was like, younger than this? How is that even? <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, uh, it was a strange one for me, because right. I, how do I know whether the person is, I mean, first of all, there's a whole philosophical question of do mm-hmm. I want to look 10 years mm-hmm. younger or whatever. Mm-hmm. But but how do I know that this person is acting with integrity in that moment and being honest with me? Or, I mean, if I were in this business, that would be the easiest mm-hmm. way to sell it, right? right. Oh, I can make you look 10 years younger, yeah, exactly, kid. You know? exactly. so, uh, so how's the consumer to know? Well, again, you got to do your research. And you know where we are uh, right now with our practice, many of the patients are referred by others. So there's a there's an automatic connection and and trust. By the way, can you tell I didn't take her up on it? Can you look at people? No, because I didn't. But can you look you, at people and go, he hasn't had this done yet, or I mean, is that? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, I like you to should st- be able to tell, right? I like yeah. to study faces and look at the facial expressions, mm. and uh, and yeah, absolutely. Can you can you tell I've had my nose enlarged? <laughs> That's why it's so big. <laughs> um, to, to, to take me back to how this all began for you, because uh, um, first of all, I'm curious about your your childhood in Iran. You grew up when you were a kid. Uh, you were a kid when the revolution happened That's in 1979. Right. You were in Iran. How would you describe your childhood in Iran? In Iran, um, 
I grew up in, uh, for the first couple of years of my life, which I don't have a, a memory of really, but my parents were studying in uh, Washington. Uh, so I spent between age, I want to say, one to about three in Washington. And then the revolution happened. My parents, my dad's education was finished in the States. And so he went back uh, to Iran. And of course, uh, we went with him. And so then I spent uh, between that time and roughly age 10 in Iran. Memories, I mean, like anyone else my age, I you know remember the beginnings of the war. I remember, you know, driving from Tehran to Mashhad where, you know, to escape some of the aerial bombings that were over Tehran. And, and I, you know, remember the feeling of vulnerability, mm. for lack of a better word. I distinctly remember, you know, on that drive, uh, which may have been in the middle parts of the night, um, something happened to our car and we were kind of stranded in the middle of the road. And, um, you know, just Iran being what it is, um, especially at that time, uh, there was a sense of belonging to anybody in that country. And so some stranger came in the middle of the night mm. and we weren't sure if it's a thief or it's somebody there to help us, uh, but it was there somebody to help us and helped us, you know, uh, get to our destination uh, in Mashhad where we spent um, uh, a few weeks. And oddly enough, at about the same time, on our way back from Mashhad to Tehran, uh, and again, I distinctly remember this, is the so first this is like time. like six years old, seven years old? Yeah, this will be, um, I believe I might, must have been around eight or nine. Okay. Uh, but I distinctly remember that it was the first time that I felt uh, something is not right with my the joints in my body. Mm. All of a sudden, I'm nine years old, I go from being an active soccer player, you know, all this stuff, to wait a second, I can't move my elbows, I can't move my knees, my entire body feels heavy, what the heck is going on? Yeah, this this is an incredible part of your story. Let, before just before we get to that, do you do you come from a medical family or your parents? I don't. No, no, they're uh, they're entrepreneurs. Huh? And you have a couple of brothers. Mm -hmm. What was like life like with them as kids? Yeah, you know, I was the oldest sibling, and so um, our story as we came to Canada, and you know, Canada in the nineteen eighties was not as you know, economically advanced as it is now. And, and so there was a struggle, you know, for my parents to settle in. So I was the oldest uh, sibling and uh, being the oldest sibling uh, to some extent had, um, you know, a position of uh, not qu quite like a parent, but kind of like a parent. Mm. And so I, w I would characterize it as a responsibility um, at that age, yeah. Would, an, would any, uh, anyone have guessed that you are gonna grow up and become a successful doctor and entrepreneur? Doctor, yeah, I mean, that was the thing to do, right? Like for us as first generation Iranians coming to Canada, myself, a lot of my friends, that was the thing to do. Mm. And uh, What about the entrepreneur celebrity Instagram guy? <laughs> uh, probably not, yeah, <laughs> that, that came later. They don't teach you that in medical school. Yeah, they don't no, teach you No, but I mean, school. well, I just wonder if, if as a kid you, uh, you know, if you were the guy setting up the lemonade stand, uh, you know, proverbially. No, I, interestingly enough, I wasn't. I was more like kind of intellectual and academic. Um, but even from my early years, I, I was a, um, uh, I did a lot of teaching. You know, I would teach um, uh, after hours, like tutor other kids. Mm. And later on in medical school, I was teaching um, uh, for a company called Kaplan. They had these uh, uh, MCAT courses. So people that had to take the MCAT exam to get into medical school. Um, you know, I was teaching the MCAT course for many summers and some of that, you know, kind of. So it sounds like you've been an A-type personality for most of your yeah, life. Yeah, goal-oriented for sure, mm -hmm. yeah. So let's get into this, the, the physical issues you had because <clears throat> you end up coming to the, the West, the U.S. first. Yes. When you're 10 years old in 1985 and you, you're suffering from this very, um, ambiguous mm -hmm. illness that mm -hmm. basically crippled your arms right. and, and legs. You couldn't walk, you were in a wheelchair. Um, that's a lot for a kid traveling from Iran to the West for the first time, or uh, to live, that is. Yeah. But what, what is your sense of that time in retrospect? Um, it's, you know, at that age, somehow my experience was that you don't internalize 
the suffering. Like I, I almost feel that it must have been so much harder for my parents to observe that. And as we left Iran, in fact, the premise that we got the visa to the United States initially was to seek medical treatment. Mm. Um, and so, you know, at that time, they wouldn't give out visas easily to Iranians. And so, you know, at the embassy, they said, okay, we're going to give a visa to you and your mom and your brothers, uh, but we're not going to give a visa to your dad because they didn't want, like, you know, perhaps the family to, to settle there permanently. And so my dad ended up coming to Canada. We ended up in the U.S., in Los Angeles. And um, I, I wouldn't characterize it as, as a type of, like, suffering or tragedy. Somehow, at that age, I was kind of rolling with the punches to a certain extent. Wow. Yeah. Did you feel different? Yes, different, yes, no question. Yeah, different, yes. But um, you didn't, sounds like you didn't see yourself as a victim somehow. Not at the time, maybe because I felt that this is temporary or we're going to find some type of a solution out of it. But I do remember, you know, if I want to go back in the memory bank, um, there was an instance at that time when we were in Los Angeles and I was just beginning treatment. So essentially I was still, you know, in a wheelchair. And, uh, and you, sorry, you couldn't move your arms? Couldn't and move, no, no. I had a condition called juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. So this is not the old age arthritis. It's a rheumatoid arthritis is an inflammatory condition. Uh -huh. And you can get it in adulthood or you can get it in childhood. I had the childhood version. And so that results in severe inflammation. Like my knee was twice the size of a normal knee, wow. my elbow. Yeah. And by the way, no one would forgive a, a, a 10 year old for being frustrated or angry or any any of those emotions that if you if yeah. you did have those you know not you know not that I remember you know I can you know talk to my parents about it but it, it just maybe felt temporary somehow and maybe you know at that time um, maybe a little bit just my as you said kind of like intellectual mindset like I, I my brain was engaged uh, regardless I wasn't mm. someone that was felt like if I'm not playing soccer, I'm, you know, missing out on everything. But I do remember, you know, there was one night, um, one of my uncles who's passed away now, but we were at his home in Beverly Hills and his home was two stories. And so we were spending the night there and obviously I could not, you know, get up the steps. And I remember my uncle, you know, carrying me and I was feeling like, oh my God, you know, I'm nine years old and I can't even get up the stairs on my own. So there were some memories like that, but there was an optimism there, you know, where it was coming from. I don't know. And I, I think it might have been harder, must have been much harder for my parents. You also have a memory at your uncle's house in L.A. I don't know if it's the same uncle of the first time uh, after a year and a half that you could walk without yeah, pain. Yeah, that's tell, a different. Yeah, that's a different uncle. Different uncle. So this is the uncle in uh, <laughs> Santa Monica, I think. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I remember spending a night there and this is now like nine, 10 months after treatment, high dosages of anti-inflammatories, physiotherapy every day to build up my, you know, muscles. And so eventually going from wheelchair to crutches mm. and then from crutches to walking. But even when I, you know, did start to walk on my own, there was always this feeling of like heaviness as if your body is being pulled into the floor. And I distinctly remember, you know, just getting up in the morning, uh, spending the night at my uncle's house and waking up and taking the first few steps and it was like wow, wow. like you know it's it's over yeah and we should do a, a shout out to the is it dr darvish who was the yeah yeah you know at that time when we came to los angeles there was a prominent rheumatologist um his name was dr darvish and uh i kind of i you know remember his face uh still even though some of my childhood memories are not very clear i remember that um, you know, he had a Porsche that he would drive to the medical mm. building, and uh, he was a great guy, yeah. So he really made the diagnosis, put me on the right medications, and then I heard years later he passed away at uh, a relatively young age, but um, uh, yeah, he definitely so made an impact. So how did all of that, that um, the experience of, of having these issues with your own body and then the experience of having a doctor um, help you return to yourself and, and go from the wheelchairs and the crutches mm. to walking again. Uh, how did that experience shape your interest or desire to get into medicine? It definitely had an impact. Um, you know, it was a very personal experience. 
I interacted a lot with doctors even after I got well, but it was kind of like a maintenance that I had mm. to undergo for a number of years. So um, I had a lot of interactions uh, with the healthcare system and uh, it definitely made an impact. And on top of that, you know, again, being first generation Iranian in a new country, um, that was kind of in some ways your path to uh, a better life. Mm. And so my friends, I remember all my high school friends, they all became, you know, uh, involved in healthcare. They all became prominent surgeons, mm. physicians, dentists. And looking back, you know, one of the, the huge things um, that I was thinking the other day really shaped who I am was that group of friends, right? Mm. Going to high school here in Toronto, having a bunch of goal-oriented, driven high school friends who were pushing each other, sometimes competing because, you know, Iranians, we like to be a little mm -hmm. bit solo, so we have to always uh, end up on top. And so that that drive, you know, the competition. I remember one of my friends who's now an orthopedic surgeon in Florida, but we were just, you know, compete on everything as far as academia went. But you were fortunate as well that you had a, a community um, when uh, you're one of these guys I'm I'm jealous of uh, because some of us came here and didn't right. you know felt like odd ducks because we were Persian and there was nobody around for miles that uh, spoke Farsi or, or or we could you know intimately identify with you at the age of 10 uh, go to LA and from what I understand you don't speak English very well at all or at all right no exactly. and and but you go for the first year without even speaking English because you're in LA and even at that point in LA, there's a Persian community, yes? Oh yes, huge, you know. Um, Tehran Jeles, right? As opposed to Tehran too. Right. But uh, yeah, I remember we, I spent almost a year in public school in Los Angeles and I could not speak a word of English <laughs> because there was four other Iranian kids in my class and they were translating everything. Uh, but then we spent three months in Atlanta, Georgia with another uncle of mine and uh, in those three months, I learned more than the entire year in L.A. because at that time in Atlanta, it was all, you know, blonde hair and blue eyed uh, kids that I had to go to school with. And, and that's when I really started to learn English. <laughs> yeah. I want to do a bit of a sidebar here of how you look. I mean, you you're born in Iran. Your first your formative years are there. But there's a lot of folks who came here at the age of 10, mm -hmm. to the West that is, who uh, don't necessarily maintain extremely strong ties to the, to their, to the Iranian community or to their, the country of their birth, et cetera. You, you really do. And one of the ways that you say you, um, not only a big part of forming your identity, but retaining your identity once you came to Canada was, was Iranian pop music. Mm -hmm. The stuff that was being made in LA in the That's in right. the eighties. Uh, tell me about seeing Andy and Kuros in uh, in the nineteen eighties. Yeah, I remember it well. You know, sometimes um, those concerts at the Harbor Castle, I think uh, Western Harbor Castle Hotel. Yeah, I think that if the Iranian Los Angeles based pop music was not there, um, then many people of of my generation would not have developed certain aspects of their Iranian identity. And, um, and that's why, you know, any chance that I get, I, you know, I love supporting Iranian artists, musicians. Me too. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and in fact, last that's year, that's why we, we have Andy to thank for that, that you, yes, <laughs> you do. And, you know, I'll give you a funny story. Every time we go to Los Angeles, uh, with my wife, uh, we always go to cover Tehran. I think it's mm -hmm. called the house of legends now. Mm -hmm. And uh, the founder of Kabare Tehran, I believe he, he's a great guy. I believe he must be in his 70s, if not more now. Uh, Mr. Uh, Ahmad Masood, I think it is. Last time I was there, this conversation me and you are having, I told him the same thing. I said, if it wasn't for Kabare Tehran and what Kabare Tehran did, supporting all those Los Angeles-based Iranian artists, mm. uh, maybe today... Um, I wouldn't have, you know, this Persian identity that I do. But you know what I what I actually kind of love about that is it's 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 a little counterintuitive because 
sometimes we think of, and I all due respect to them, of course, but we think of that L.A. 80s Iranian pop as, you know, the kind of cheesy stuff or, or light, you know, a disposable pop, et cetera, even if it's songs that people remember and sing along, they remember from their childhood or whatever it was. But this formed the spine of a really important, this was really important to you it in was. terms of uh, um, a cultural... Yes. A flashpoint that, that that kept you in touch with being Iranian. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. You know, just it helped with that identity. You know, now you had a concert to go to with your friends, and you know, I remember again, first generation Iranians. The first time I wanted to go, I think it was a Shahram Shapare club concert in Toronto, and my cousin was like a pro, the promoter, so I had got tickets. And, uh, you know, us first generation Iranians, we had it much harder than our siblings. And I remember I got back home late that night from the concert. Might have been like 1.30, You mean harder a. than your younger siblings, right? Than my younger yeah, siblings, sorry. They yeah, get an easier pass, yeah so, exactly. Yeah. So, so I, you know, get back home at like 1.30 in the morning. And the next day, my dad was literally threatening to close his suitcases <laughs> and move the entire family <laughs> back to Iran oh. because it was an adjustment for them, right? Meanwhile, you know, my younger siblings, uh, <laughs> once they went through their teenage years, right. you know, my parents would have been very happy your if they were home at one thirty. Blaming poor Shahram Shahbaz <laughs> yes, for all the right. yeah. all your hooligan, hooliganism. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so somewhere in and around all of this, you end up choosing medicine, and I'm I. We've talked a little bit about the passion that you felt for medicine for personal reasons. Uh, uh, what you went through, etc. Um, but I, but I do wonder about uh, the emphasis on higher education, mm -hmm. the middle upper class Persian thing. Uh, you talked about your friends being successful surgeons or people who work in the healthcare field now. Um, you see that as a blessing. Could it also be uh, too much pressure to conform or succeed in a certain field? I mean, was it really? Uh, an option for you or or did you feel like you had to do this and we got lucky because you're so passionate about it yeah um i don't think i had to do it i, I think i i had other options but you know looking back um i think you have to be careful with the pursuit of higher education because education can be a business in its own right and so if you're not goal oriented and if you're not following a specific path, you can end up almost being on a hamster wheel and not getting to your destination. So when I have younger patients in the office and we, you know, during the treatment, maybe we're chatting about uh, career choices, education, you know, my viewpoint on it is, of course, quite different than perhaps the way it would have been with my parents. Um, and in fact, as somebody who spent a decade in the education system, you know, I have to say that you have to really choose carefully and mm. do your research and know what you're getting into i find still you know many people get into career paths without ever spending a day you know in that environment so i tell them if you want to be you know in healthcare if you want to be in medicine dentistry even if you're spending a month being the secretary in an office you're going to get a lot of information whether this is your calling uh, or not so that's very very important so when you're one of your future kids says mm -hmm. uh dad i, I just want to be a backup singer in a band that's for my career you're going to be okay with that yeah the short answer would be yes mm -hmm. i think that the education system overall actually does not true does not do a good job teaching the really valuable skills mm. so what are the really valuable skills you know some you know being able to do public speaking, being creative, innovative. So if they want to be the backup singer, well, they might have to also know how to manage their finances, how to brand themselves, how to innovate within their field. So I've learned just as much, if not more, from self-education as opposed to traditional mm -hmm. education. I, I, feel, I feel like that's a... Uh, I'd like to think that was an honest answer, but I mm -hmm. feel like there's still maybe a conversation that happens in there with the kid that it's like, but you could take over Skin Beauty MD in a few years. No, Jean, it, it's not. You know, you'd be surprised. A lot of a lot of a lot of physicians, a lot of dentists, 
just as many of them will actually advise their kids against it as they uh, would for it. Yeah. yeah, that's that's actually interesting. Yeah, it's like actors saying, "I don't want my kid to be exactly. an actor." That's the anything but be you know. Yeah, yeah. if you, you know the insides. Exactly, of it. if you know the insides and if you know some of the challenges, I think it's more important, you know, for what you're doing to match your inner calling. And maybe for me, you know, um, the inner calling to to help with rejuvenation, help with people's confidence, beauty, aesthetics, that was there and I geared my medical career that way. Now medicine, the one nice thing about medicine is there's so many different specialties. So let's say if somebody is more technology oriented, mm. well now they might go into something like you know interventional radiology mm. as an example. If somebody doesn't wanna talk to people, well they could go into pathology and look at mm. you know microscopes. Uh, but I know what you mean. You know, in fact, coming in for this interview, I was thinking, oh my God, I'm getting this cough and you know, I'm gonna have to clear my throat. Why didn't and, I go into pathology? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And you know, how does Gian, you know, pull off all these interviews every week? This is so hard. Um, so yes, you know, once once you're in it, uh, then then it, then you have a different insight knowledge. Well, let's talk about the decision you made because you you, you probably wouldn't be here if you had chosen to go into, uh, maybe you would be, but um, uh, it, it is the path that you've taken in medicine that has led you to become known and mm -hmm. and uh, one of the reasons you're here. This decision in 2006 to go from primary care as the primary thing right. you do to um, medical aesthetics. What precipitated that decision? A few things. Interestingly enough, probably the, the first thing was my experience as a patient. So I was in my late 20s and I always still had persistent acne. Mm. So I would never have clear skin. Um, so finally, here I am. I've you know finished medical school, finished residency, and I finally have the time to go see a physician to take care of this uh, acne. And so I remember he put me on Accutane, which is a six-month course of medication. And then after the Accutane, I did three. It's an oral thing. It's an you oral. Take? Yeah, it's yeah. pretty pretty heavy. Uh, after the uh, six months, I did three courses of laser treatments, which at the time were quite pricey. For the time, it was like five thousand dollars back in two thousand and six. But I distinctly remember what a positive interaction it was for me mm. as a patient, and like how grateful I was that I had done this and he had helped me through this. Um, so that kind of formed the genesis for me because it always it was important for me to do something impactful. And once I felt how impactful that journey for me as a patient was. You literally felt the difference of what it feels like yes. to have your face yes, absolutely. Uh, cleaned, yeah. fit, your face yeah. Uh, yeah. reformed somehow. Exactly. And it was, you know, oddly enough, a doctor in Barrie. And again, I distinctly remember the encounter. Uh, as well, and there's lots of other medical encounters which you won't remember, mm -hmm. but because it was impactful, I remember it, I remember the laser procedures, and um, and that formed the genesis, and shortly after that is when I first started to attend some of the medical aesthetics conferences, and I really had to make a decision because I was also an associate physician in a primary care clinic at the time, and the primary care clinic um, had basically come up for sale. So I could essentially be an owner or a co-owner. Mm -hmm. And that was an easier path, honestly, at the time. Um, but I made the decision, I'm gonna follow my passion, even yeah, though well, I had to let, start let me from get the to that, but up. And then maybe, I'm, maybe I've got some stereotypes mm -hmm. about what medical aesthetics is, but isn't trying to cure some acne different from uh, Botox? Isn't it a different mission? Um, well, remember our practice, medical aesthetics, I mean, Botox was the genesis procedure and most people come into a medical aesthetics practice uh, through that. Uh, but we do lots of other things, including using you know fillers to improve skin texture, skin quality, uh, some acne management as well I do in the practice. But I would ca categorize them as all in the same uh, you know scope. You're improving your appearance, you're mm. improving your aesthetics. Because if you've got, let's say, as you're interviewing me here, if you've got a deep frown line, mm. you know, it will impact. Do I? <laughs> no. <laughs> it, will, it will impact uh, the emotion that you're, that you're portraying. And, uh. um, you know, I remember listening to actually an interview that you did uh, on the Rook platform with the uh, famous uh, Iranian-based surgeon, Dr. Sheila Nazaria. Yes. And she said something that really stuck with me. In and Beverly said, Hills in yes, LA. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And she's so well-spoken too. She said, you know, a lot of times people don't do a cosmetic procedure 
to look different, mm. but rather they do it to look more similar to the perception right. of themselves. Find themselves. Yes. 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 Yeah. And so if you are 65, but you feel like you're 50, you're fit, you're, you know, you're healthy, you're vibrant, you're aware of everything that's going on in the world. Well, why, why wouldn't you want your face to reflect that vitality? And it may surprise you. Our oldest patient, I love saying this, is 92 years old. Now, imagine how resilient you have to be to come for Man Botox. Or a woman. It's a woman, Italian what woman. What does the 92-year-old woman get done? Uh, Botox she... and a little bit of filler, yeah. And, uh, but we have many more patients than you could imagine in their 70s and 80s. Hmm. But they're all of a specific type. They're usually in good shape physically. They walk with a nice tall posture. They're well-dressed to the point where when I go into the room, I have to double-check my posture so I don't mm. look older than this you know, patient who's there in their 70s and 80s. Uh, psychologically very resilient, very curious about the world. Um, in fact, there is one that you know, every time she comes in, we have the most engaging you know, conversations about the world. She always recommends good books for me to read. You don't necessarily see that type of a patient in a medical practice because by definition, patients that frequent medical practice more are often obviously experiencing mm -hmm. some type of mm -hmm. you know, pathology, um, sometimes uh, psychological issues, other things. But are they uh, usually wealthy? I mean, mm -hmm. the 92-year-old, I'm assuming she's not a pensioner if she if she's coming to you and getting... Uh, well, I, I which can, is which I, is a I big part of a you yeah. know the discussion around the kind of work you do mm -hmm. is is it's not really accessible to everybody, is it? Well, I would argue against that. In fact, I can give you a specific example. That ninety-two year old, she's retired, and and uh, you know her husband was a Italian hairstylist. This is probably before the days where you know hairstylists were celebrities Rock in their stars, own right, yeah. yeah, as well. And so, no, it was about very reasonable means. Um, no, I think the services, and that's part of the beauty of of medical aesthetics, is that. It is accessible to pretty much everybody. You know, I once did a, a interview where we talked about the amount of money that women spend on just makeup products, right? Mm. Uh, but if you prioritize certain other things like the cosmetic injections, well, maybe now you don't need that, you know, uh, expensive makeup product or that, you know, expensive clothing that makes you look, you know, slim because you know your face, um, uh, your face looks the way that you mm. want it to look. So. I think it's in life. It's always a what matter of priority. What if somebody comes in and really wants a procedure, and you think it'd be great for them, and they don't have the? I mean, have you ever? Do you have some sort of? I don't want to out you here, yeah. so that you have to offer deals to people. But, but mm. uh, you know, do, do you work with them somehow? I mean, sometimes you know, if I really feel like somebody needs a procedure, and and if things are really really uh, in a situation that they can't make it work, you know, they sometimes come as models for our teaching mm. programs. Um, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. We're not talking about thousands and thousands of mm -hmm. dollars by any means. And occasionally, you know, I'll tell someone, you know, this is the impact the procedure would have. Mm -hmm. um, you know, come and see us when things are better because, again, you need a goal to aspire to. Mm -hmm. Let me let me take a couple of steps okay. back because we're now we're talking about you as a successful right. um, uh, clinic owner and, and founder, et cetera. But it, it wasn't... Uh, a super easy part, uh, you know, path to get here. You, you back in two thousand and six, as you said, you choose to open your own clinic. You didn't have to do that, um, but that takes some some gumption. And it occurs to me that uh, I think you said it earlier: the entrepreneurial part is not what you've actually gone to medical school for, right? No. So tell me about the difference between medical training and business training, and and how you got up to speed on the business part. I was forced into it, you know. Um, I think that that is one of the deficiencies of the educational system. Um, even if you're not in medicine, like I interviewed somebody who was uh, coming to our clinic uh, to look at a digital marketing position, and they had recently graduated from a university, I won't say which one, in Ontario. And I was just dumbfounded by how little they knew about you know, digital marketing. And U of some, T. No. <laughs> actually. <laughs> and so, you know, university tends to lag behind, right? And so unless, you know, you're really, as I said, goal-oriented and strategic about it and you're seeking out those opportunities to augment what you're learning from the textbooks with real-life uh, practice. And so 
Medical school maybe is the worst uh, example of this because it's it can be so one dimensional in scope, and um, I I think the educational system um, needs a lot of revamp. So in, in all your stages. case, you open a business and you don't. I had no idea what I was doing. I had no idea what I was doing. Yeah. And how how did that manifest itself then? I mean, I know you've said you had some difficult years at the beginning of the practice getting things going. Um, what was the, what was the nature of that, and and what did you tell yourself in terms of uh, persevering and having faith that you could uh, build this thing? Yeah, you know, as I said, there was a vision, but um, challenge and difficulty may be an understatement. You know, it, it was pretty pretty hard, and um, in the first few years, you know, there were times that I was doing both the medical aesthetics and I was working elsewhere as a physician to allow for things to continue and for us mm. to to build up. Um, so yeah, to call it a challenge was an understatement, but I'll tell you one thing, looking back, patience helped me, uh, being patient, having the attribute mm. of being patient. But one thing I learned, um, this is now more in the entrepreneurial realm, is that actually being too patient can be a major weakness in an entrepreneur. So what's an example of how impatience helped you? Well, I'm just, you know, much quicker with my decision making now. And and if something is not working, um, I don't identify with it. Um, so you're just so slow. And also the go. point being, if it's not working, no one to hold them, no one to fold them, right. as the, the old song uh, would say. But, but it, that's a tough one because... Um, the gurus of this kind of thing, I mean, we've had a couple of them on the show, uh, of Iranian background, yes. Dr. Ali Parsa, Hadi Partovi. You know, the mantra of a startup, the mantra of a new business, et cetera, is perseverance, keep going, you know, it's uh, don't expect things too fast. So uh, I, I disagree with that. You do? I do. You know, so there's this concept in the startup world, uh, MVP, minimal viable product. So when I, you know, if look at certain projects and, you know, I'm an avid reader of, you know, uh, business enterprises and startups and everything, I see so many of them that they try to perfect something. Whereas you got to have your MVP, your minimal viable product, and from there you move on and you decide if it's the right path. Mm. And if it is, you look at ways to, to scale up. What was the turning point or what was the moment that you knew bingo, I've got success. This is turning into something now. The turning point, I don't know if I can, you know, there's that saying, um, which I guess in, in this application would be the reverse. There's a saying in the business world, which is how did you go bankrupt? <laughs> and the person says, you know, slowly then all at once, right? Because things happen slowly and then you find yourself, oh my God, where am I? Now that can work in reverse as well. So the successes were, building slowly and then they hit a critical uh, threshold mm -hmm. and in my case it was like just put my head down and sheer willpower um, but I don't recommend that path I think you know you ha that's kind of the you know first generation Iranian mentality and that's kind of growing up in in high school and and you know but being an academic you, and being a bookworm I mean did you have people around you maybe medical friends of yours who didn't go into the medical aesthetics say, hey, come on, man, why don't you get back to primary yes. practice? Or you know. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, when I evaluate myself and I think part of learning is, is to evaluate yourself, it, I was somebody who was very sensitive to doing what I truly loved, okay? But I had colleagues that were not as sensitive to that. They were much more practical so for them it was more like I'm gonna do 10 15 years doing something I don't love but then you know that's giving me the resources later on to do something that I love mm. both paths can work and I don't want people to discount you see people tell you do what you love but they don't tell you the second part that it's extreme it can be extremely hard to make doing what you love a successful financially viable enterprise. Have you 
have you noticed a change in the last 15 years in your client base? I mean, obviously it's grown, but besides the fact that it's gotten bigger, uh, is it a different kind of person that walks through the doors today than, than in 2006, or mm -hmm. has it been a uh, one linear line kind of thing? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, the last time we did a chart audit, at least in our practice, you know, I, I think we must have one of the most multicultural practices maybe in, in the world. And I, I hope I'm not exaggerating, but uh, because of our location in North York, in Toronto, uh, right? It's like this intersection, yeah. multiracial, Iranian, Korean, Russian, Middle Eastern, Ukrainian, everybody's there. And so, um, you know, what kind of trends? There's a trend towards younger hmm. patients, right? Whereas before this may have been more of a, you know, I want to look younger type of a procedure to now I'm young, I want to look more beautiful mm -hmm. or I've got, you know, a little weakness in my chin, the rest of my face I love, I want to improve the weakness well, in the chin. How do you feel chin. about that? Yeah, I think it's fair game. Yeah, why not? Uh, how, young, how young is too young? Is there, I mean, we is have... There we have lots of patients in their 20s. Um, and um, Is a teen teenager too young for injectable? For cosmetics, I would yeah. yes, say yeah. yes. So yeah. you would just say no. Yes. Right. Somebody comes in with her mom and says, I want Yes, yeah. yeah. The only time where we have, you know, teenage patients uh, possibly is if they're doing it for a medical indication. Because mm -hmm. I don't know if you're aware, but there is some medical indications for Botox. One of them is excessive sweating, so hyperhidrosis. So 1% of the population, they have you know, excessive sweat glands uh, in, in their axilla, their armpits. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, imagine if you're sweating too much, you know, that can make you feel awkward in social circumstances. And so, um, you know, occasionally with the parent's consent and if their height and weight and everything um, allows us to do it, you know, we will inject Botox for excessive sweating treatment in somebody that's under 18. But for aesthetics, I think, uh, yeah, you want to be definitely over 18. You, you referenced Dr. Sheila Nazarian earlier talking about um, people who get uh, work done, mm -hmm. um, feeling like they're they're actually finding themselves more. Right. I'm going back to who I really am mm -hmm. by by getting these injections done, et cetera. Uh, you, you said something really interesting around this, which is that it's your observation that uh, the, the stereotype or the gen, the orthodox thought is that people do this for the sake of others, for some audience that is going to look at them or to, to be more attractive to others. Who are, but your observation is people actually do this for themselves, to for, for how mm -hmm. they feel when they look in the mirror. Can you speak to that? Absolutely. I think we had a beautiful laboratory experiment with everything that happened with the pandemic, because here's the pandemic and especially our experience in Ontario with you know the, the long shutdowns. I was myself surprised at the level of demand that there was for medical aesthetics procedures, even during the pandemic. So every time, like if we were closed for a short period of time, every time we reopened, there was like double the demand, even though people were not going to like social functions, they were working often remotely from home. It's so, interesting, huh? Yes. They still wanted to do it. They still wanted to do it. So that to me proved how much of a internal inner thing it is. Uh, it's how you feel when you get up in the morning and you want how you look to match how you feel. When somebody's, when you feel like somebody has unrealistic expect, ex expectations, mm -hmm. uh, y you know, when uh, when somebody says, yeah, and your face has gotten topoli, <laughs> I mean, it's like maybe I should eat less KFC, you know, or go to the gym more. Like there, it's not only things that you can necessarily solve, right, exactly. in, in the, the Skin Beauty MD clinic. So... So do you talk them through that? I mean, as a, as a doctor, do you sort of go, you know, you should probably hit the gym a few times a week or something like that? Yeah, you know, I think um, when when they're there for a specific goal, it, it's pretty simple. Either we can deliver that goal to them or, or we can't. Mm. And you have to be a little bit careful with, you know, with, with saying some of the peripheral things because um, imagine if you're somebody that you are overweight because you're on medications mm. as a side effect, right? Like it's not as simple as that, sure. right? Or imagine if you're somebody, and this happens frequently, or I should say it's not uncommon for it to happen, where you look beautiful and young and amazing, but you're depressed 
and your depression sees everything bad, mm. both the world and yourself. Mm. Now, you might think it's simple enough for me to tell somebody you're having clinical depression, and so your assessment of yourself is not accurate. But I've learned through experience that's actually a tough conversation to have. So, you know, I might have some... Because it's not your gig? It's not your gig, and yes, they might think rightly or wrongly that you know, they're being judged. And mm. so you have to be careful about that because it's a limited scope of an interaction. Right, right. And, uh, and then if somebody does have clinical depression, they could also be more sensitive, more irritable. And, you know, I pride myself a, a little bit in that I'm very good at that, right? So mm. if I talk with someone for a few minutes, most of the time I can get a sense of what else is going mm. on through the words that they use, through the expressions that they have. You do a lot of teaching these days yeah. you become well known as a, mm -hmm. a teacher in this space in the in the Botox and the fillers and the yeah. injectables uh, who are you teaching and what do they want to know so this is uh, we are, our program is for physicians also for nurse practitioners and nurses um, they are they are healthcare uh, people in healthcare that may be a little bit burnt out frankly speaking uh, through working in healthcare there may be people that are in healthcare but have a persona that you know is comfortable being in the aesthetics world and being in the celebrity marketing world and some of the things that you pointed out. Um, so those would be the kinds of individuals that would seek us out. A big part of what you do is there is a real marketing aspect to it. Mm -hmm. uh, we were at a dinner, the same dinner, and I saw that somebody recognized you or somebody said, and then there was a group of people and they all looked you up on Instagram and started following you, you know. Uh, that That's not something that somebody does with the most doctors or surgeons. Uh, uh, is that taxing on you? Do you enjoy doing that? Do you have to like now spend time on social media, you know, in between being a doctor? I mean, that's another thing you wouldn't have learned in med medical school. That's right, you definitely don't learn that. Uh, yes, to answer your question, it is taxing. I had a friend of mine who's a prominent builder, and he came up to me at one of these functions, and uh, and he said, you know, I love some of the messaging in your Instagram posts and stories, and it's so positive. And I looked at him and I said, you know, sometimes I envy your work because you don't have to do the social media marketing. Um, it can be very taxing. Uh, the Instagram algorithm, YouTube algorithm, you know, they're ruthless. If you're not putting out good quality content, they won't put it in, in the face of people that want to see it. Um, you live in Toronto. Mm -hmm. How come? Why haven't you moved to the States like uh, a lot of rich doctors do, where they can get richer? <laughs> well, this is a dinner conversation. Um, you know, my wife has been on my case for the last number of months in particular because we had such a harsh winter in Toronto. Gian, I don't have a good answer to that. You know, all I can say... You don't have a good answer. You don't have a Your good answer You're supposed to be to Canada. I love Canada. The, <laughs> well, you know, the maple leaf. I mean, you know... Well, I'm going to tell you. No, diversity. I, yeah. Uh, you know, I feel that actually Canada is experiencing a brain drain. And I think it's much more significant than people realize. And I think, in fact, I had this conversation with a, a federal member of parliament that what is Canada's brand other than cultural diversity, right? If we look at Canada as a company, what is the brand? Why does it have to be just, you know, the cultural diversity or let's say an advocate for peace? Why are we not celebrating, you know, Canada as um, a technology incubator? Even as a tourist destination, you know, certain parts of Canada are just beautiful, sure. right? Like yeah. whenever I go to Montreal, I'm like, you know, why? Like, Montreal is just one of the best places in North America to visit in the summertime, you know, but why is it so low key? Why do you like go in the United States and so few people from the States have come up to experience Montreal, experience mm -hmm. Toronto, experience Vancouver? Where is the brand? Um, but you know, Feridun uh, Moshiri has a, has a poem, the famous Persian poet, Maninjari uh, Shedar Khokyan. And so sometimes even in the middle of a winter, Canadian winter storm, 
as I, you Your know, is yeah, dar khak. Dar khak. Yeah, and I'm like, I don't know what I love about this place, but I'm going down <laughs> Young Street. And of course, by every February, you want to move, and then the weather starts to get better. Right. And you're like, you know what? This is one heck of a nice city. Well, you have to keep your partner happy, too. If she's, uh, you know, you're going to have to, you might lose the debate at some point, which would be sad because we'd hate to lose you from yeah. Toronto, but gain you in another place. Um, the, the, the Persian community has grown shockingly, exponentially, massively in right. the last decade, 15 years in Toronto. Strangely enough, pretty much in and around where your clinic is in Toronto. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, has that been good for business, I, I can guess? Yes, it has been good, uh, no question. Um, you know, when a business is more mature like ours is, it's less dependent on a specific niche of clients. Mm. So, you know, I would say that looking back, maybe we overly narrowed our niche and we had a strong presence in the Iranian community in particular. And to that point, you know, one of the distinctions between Canada and U.S. is, of course, you know, we love the multicultural aspect of Canada, but that can be a double-edged sword as well because it can keep you too narrow in your comfort zone. Whereas the U.S. is that big melting pot where that traditional, you know, cultural identity diffuses into, you know, something that's more of a blank state, and you you go from that blank state. Also, I mean, don't Persians? Didn't we establish that Persians disproportionately uh, do this kind of these kind of procedures, uh, or is that you know, is that a yeah, stereotype? You would think that. But I it's, do think it's that. more universal than uh, you might you might expect. Uh, yeah, it's more universal and. You know, even if you look at history, you know, I was like reading articles. That we lead the world in nose jobs. I know that. That's part. true. Can't yes. take that away from that's me. True. Yeah. That's true. That's true. That's true. That's true. But, you know, even if you look at history, like, you know, the, the ancient Egyptians were using, you know, chemicals to enhance their, you know, eyelash appearance. So mm -hmm. it's not a new phenomenon. It's always been important. It's just now we have these injections and before... Um, you know, there was something else. There was hair dye or there was something else. Yeah, it's a great pleasure to talk to you. Uh, you you didn't cough once or maybe you did <laughs> cough once, but your greatest fears were not realized. There was very little coughing. Uh, a couple of um, general questions before I, I let you go. And I thank you so much thank for the you. time Thanks you've given us. Um, what's the hardest part of what you do? The hardest part is is the business aspect for sure. Um, a lot of the things that happen behind the scenes uh, to be able to be in a position to have patients come into the office and get the treatments that they like. So that would be the first part. The second part, I think, would be um, you know managing patient expectations. And I'm really skilled at that, but occasionally, uh, despite the fact that I'm skilled at it, I sometimes read an individual incorrectly with, with you mm. know their goals and what they have in mind, and then they surprise me. It happens to me now maybe once a year, uh, but it still happens. And so I think that's that's the second part. And finally, what are you most proud of these days? Well, these days um, I'm most proud of being resilient, being able to. Um, be involved in this industry, we alluded to it earlier, from a position of high integrity. You know, a lot of opportunities have come into my life which may have resulted in shortcuts or maybe temporary success. Um, but some of the decisions I'm most proud of are that, um, you know, I stuck with ethics and a high standard um, and, um, and sometimes it was at you know personal loss, um, but I stuck with my with my ethics. Uh, but lastly speaking, you know I'm going to a different phase of life, and uh, my wife is pregnant, a son to be born, and so uh, that's a whole new perspective on everything. And I'm sure if you ask me this question uh, in the future, uh, the answer uh, would have something to do with uh, the birth of this uh, this child. Great to have you here. Thank you for this. Thanks for having me. Dr. Amir Ruzati, founder and director of Skin Beauty MD. He's been with me in the Rook studio today.